Scottish countryside has been the home of many secrets and many adventures. Dick Turpin's ride to York, the Wonder Jet, and more recently, the Flying Wing. To men with a dream, the future is a gamble and a challenge, a chance to attempt what has never been done before. In the lovely Lincolnshire village of Bourne, pre-war home of the famous ERA racing cars, lived such a man, Raymond Mays. A man who wanted to build a team of racing cars that would enhance our national prestige in Grand Prix racing. To make a dream come true is not easy. It must first of all be planned, and so Peter Berthon and Eric Richter joined Raymond Mays. As the dream became a drawing board, the first step towards reality was taken. Once again, the old ERA workshops next to Raymond May's home became a place of imagination and daring. It was a time for theories and ideas, for revisions and decisions, for resolving the 101 complexities of design that had to be planned in detail before construction could commence. To build an experimental racing car takes time and money. Raymond Mays went to the motor industry for help, and inspired by his burning enthusiasm, many leading firms readily gave their support. The BRM Trust was formed with Donald McCulloch as chairman, while Alfred Owen arranged for the parent firm in his group, Rubery Owen and Company, to be responsible for all the progress work. But to coordinate such a project was not easy. Most of the assembly work was done at Bourne, while many component parts were made in the works of the various supporting companies. Progress was often slow, for the components of the BRM had to be machined to the very highest standards of quality and accuracy. Micrometers, gauges and calculations, crack tests and dimensional checks. A vigilant eye is needed when so much depends on a single part. Cylinder liners, things of cold and delicate beauty fashioned in the gleaming steel. How much tolerance? Dimensional check. A fraction too much with a 16-cylinder engine might raise the capacity to over 1,500 cc's and put the car out of its class. Slowly, the BRM took shape, and it was a proud moment for the team when the first complete chassis was ready for assembly. Better brakes, speed and safety. New type assemblies were made by Girling, tested and developed at the Ferodo test rig before installation. Bits and pieces, nuts and bolts, fragments of reality. They are the stuff of the BRM, the guts, the life, the magic of the dream so many believed in and helped to build. Products and names, testaments of faith. A special test house by Sir John Black and the Standard Motor Company. Test equipment by Heenan and Froud. Special superchargers by Rolls-Royce. Sound insulating equipment by Burgess Products. New theories, new ideas. How to run the engine without an exhaust pipe. Carrier Engineering Company made a new type of ventilating system. First tests proved that the basic engineering design was sound. A prototype body was made and fitted to the chassis, but the going was not easy. It was always a fight against that constant enemy, time, time and money, lack of sufficient financial support, delays, difficulty in obtaining vital parts from firms who were themselves suffering from crippling restrictions and lack of raw materials. Details of construction, the question of ignition for the high-speed multi-cylinder engine, a tricky problem ably solved by Lucas. Without payment, heads of some of the largest and most progressive firms gave unstintingly of their time and of themselves to further the cause of the BRM. At last came the day when the outside world saw the car for the first time. On a disused aerodrome at Fokingham, Raymond Mays drove it on test. who were present were deeply impressed and agreed that the car showed great promise. But it was only a beginning. The car went back to Bourne to undergo the long period of patient study and exacting tests that every thoroughbred racing car must have when it leaves the assembly line. Teething troubles had to be eliminated. Then, in May 1951, when the royal family went to see the Grand Prix d'Europe at Silverstone, the British motor rating public watched the car do a demonstration tour of the circuit. When they were shown the BRM by Donald McCulloch and Raymond Mays, the royal family expressed their enthusiasm and wished the new British racing venture every success. 
The cars were to race for the first time in August for the International Trophy, but on both practice days there was no sign of them at the course. Even on the day itself, the great Raymond Sonnet was a man without a car. And then a plane, specially chartered by the Daily Express, flew in one of the cars at the last moment. Engine trouble had caused the delay. Misfiring and backfiring at high speeds had made the engines blow up. Cylinder liners had burst. Connecting rods had buckled, damaging the engine so severely that they had to be completely rebuilt. At Bourne, mechanics had worked night and day, week after week, to get the cars ready in time. Then, on the day before the race, when the cars were about to leave for Silverstone, the same fault occurred again. Another gruelling all-night session followed, and at last one car was repaired and flown to the course. So that the car could start in the race, Samay was allowed to do three qualifying laps. sounded fine, and Somi was delighted with the car's performance. It seemed at last that Dame Fortune was willing to bestow her favours, and despite a last-minute rush, hopes ran high. But others were just as determined and just as hopeful. Idotti, making a last-minute check on the Alfa Romeos, Etoncelin, settling down behind the wheel of his Talbot. The cars lined up for the start, and all eyes were on the British hope. But, as the flag fell, tragedy struck. The BRN rolled forward a few inches and stopped, both driving shafts broken. An incredible piece of misfortune, and a bitter blow to the tired men who had worked so long and so hard. With heavy hearts, they watched Farina win for Italy in an Alfa Romeo. Many feared that this would be the end of the venture, but defeat was not to be admitted. Although deeply disappointed at the car's failure, the men responsible for the BRM were more determined than ever to achieve eventual success. Work went on unceasingly and untiringly until at last one car was entered for the Goodwood Trophy in September. Goodwood and Rain treacherous conditions for any car. Vera, in his two-stage blown Maserati, was the man to be watched, but Rich Parnell, driving the BRM, was confident. The flag fell, but this time there was no mistake. The BRM was away, to a slow start admittedly, but at the end of the first lap she was leading the field. It was an anxious Raymond Mays who watched the car tear past the pits in first place. The rain-swept course was slippery and dangerous. Parnell was being pressed hard by Vera. How easy to make a mistake when the eyes of the world were upon him. But the car roared past lap after lap in first place and the crowd cheered as they'd seldom done before. To many British enthusiasts, it was one of the happiest days in motor racing history. What a moment of triumph for Peter Berthon and the BRN mechanics as they watched their hopes being fulfilled and racing history being made. Down went the flag and Great Britain won the Richmond Trophy with a British car and a British driver. The dream that began so long ago was at last coming true. It was a great day for Reg Parnell, Raymond Mays and the BRN. It was perhaps the end of the beginning.